Hey there. I wanted to make sure my wonderful listeners were aware of some cool things I've got going on right now. If you want a weekly email that gives you the top six happenings in the world of MS for that week, sign up for my Friday night six pack at fumsnow.com forward slash get the scoop. Also, I'm getting ever so close to launching the Patients Getting Paid course and membership community where you'll learn how to find flexible work opportunities so you can better accommodate your disease. Take better care of yourself and still make money. Sound good? Get on the waiting list right now at fumsnow.com forward slash patients getting paid and I'll send you an email as soon as that program launches. And finally, we're almost up to the 50th episode of the FUMS podcast show. I can't believe it. In celebration, I'm giving away a $50 Visa gift card for your mug shot. Go grab an FUMS coffee mug at fumsnow.com forward slash shop. Take a picture of yourself holding it and post it on the FUMS Facebook page and you could win. Share your mugshot. Don't drive off the road trying to write all this down. All of this information can be found in today's show notes at FUMSnow.com forward slash episode 47. Okay, let's get to the episode, shall we? Welcome to the FUMS Now podcast show, where you'll gain information, inspiration, and motivation for living your best life with multiple sclerosis. Find us online at FUMSnow.com. I'm your host, Kathy Reagan Young. My guest today is Peggy Manchester, a professional board certified wellness coach. She holds a bachelor's degree in exercise science from Wayne State University. Her career includes 20 plus years of experience in the health and fitness industry in a variety of leadership roles. She also has MS and has a long history of treatments, including various DMTs. Eventually, she decided to try stem cell therapy, and that's what we're talking about today. Let's go meet Peggy. Hello, Peggy, and welcome to the FUMS podcast show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here with you today. Oh, thanks so much for being here and for sharing your experiences. I really appreciate it. So if you wouldn't mind, please, um, could you share your MS story, like how you were diagnosed? Sure. So um, I was diagnosed officially when I was 30 years old. So that would have been in 1996. Mm -hmm. I had um, a couple bouts of optical neuritis when I was in my young 20s, like 22, 23 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, did not know that I had MS at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think they were looking at that. And then I had a incident where I had, um, kind of lost sort of the, um, the functionality of my left arm Mm -hmm. and, um, I didn't know what was wrong. And I consulted a friend who happened to be a neurologist and he definitely said he thought it was a neurological issue. And so I ended up going to a um, neurologist, and that's when they diagnosed me with MS. Mm. And they diagnosed me with relapse remitting MS at that time. Yeah. So, how long did it take to get a diagnosis? Um, after after I had had that initial um, issue with my left arm, mm-hmm. you know, anywhere around, not that long, maybe oh, two good. or three months. Oh, good. And that that wasn't that wasn't wasn't hard for me to get a diagnosis once I had that additional symptom. Yeah. Like I said, I had been in and out of the hospital a couple of times with optical neuritis mm. and they had treated me with steroids. Okay. They just, nobody thought to do an MRI or diagnose me with MS Gosh. at that point. Yeah. I hear these stories all the time and thankfully they seem to be getting fewer, lesser, um, yeah, as we're advancing. Much, yeah. yeah. So Thank when you. I was diagnosed in 1996, there was only, uh, there was no current DMT um, therapies mm-hmm. on the market, DMT, um, disease modifying therapies. Um, but beta serum was coming out within the next 12 to 24 months. Mm. And I chose not to go on beta serum at the time. Oh, you did. And then, mm-hmm, and I did not, I didn't go mm-hmm. on, I did not go on beta serum. And then Copaxin came out, Copaxin came out about two years after beta serum. And I decided to go on, um, Copaxin cause I had another flare up. Mm, okay. And so, so that's, that was my first DMT. Oh, okay. And how did that work for you? Um, well, the Copaxin, you know, kept me steady for a while. The first, um, first 10 to 13 years that I had MS, I had very, um, little disability in terms mm-hmm. of my walking and my gait. And I had a little bit of a limp, um, and I had some bladder issues, but I had very, um, very minimal, um, 
issues other than that, I didn't really start getting um, a pronounced limp and really noticing that I couldn't walk very far. That happened when I was around the age of 45 is when I started to really notice mm. um, that I was really um, having some trouble. Mm-hmm. And, and you were still on Copaxone at the time? Uh, so when I started noticing that I was having some trouble, I decided to make a switch to a more aggressive drug and I went on Tysabri. Oh, gotcha. So I actually switched neurologists because my current neurologist um, said to me, well, you look well and you look like you're going to well. I don't Great. want to be aggressive. And I thought to myself, you don't see me on my bad days. Right. You know, I, I tend to be a person who weight trains. So when you look at me, I look like I'm really athletic, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, I know my abilities and I knew that I, you know, I can't walk very far. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wanted to be more aggressive. So I ended up switching <sighs> neurologists to a neurologist for you. more aggressive in their thinking, in his thinking. You know, I hear this all the time. I mean, in the MS community, we do talk a lot about how others say, well, but you look so good or, you know, mm-hmm. and that it's an invisible disease, but I hate to hear that really pisses me off that a yeah. neurologist said that to you too. I'm glad yeah. that you, um, kicked that was one. Proactive. Yeah, that was proactive. <laughs> yes. And so, okay. Then the next doc put you on, uh, on Tysabri. So I was on Tysabri for about, um, about three or four years. Um, it was four years, Mm -hmm. but again, um, I kind of, kind of developed this progressive secondary progressive MS, which I was pretty Mm -hmm. sure I knew I had, but nobody really addressed that. And every time I went to see my neurologist, I'd say, you know, he'd say your MRIs are stable, which is great that my MRIs are still, I said, yeah, I know they're stable, but I'm, I'm, I'm getting worse. I can walk Mm -hmm. less. I knew I knew that I was more and more fatigued right. in my ability to walk, you know, functionally, it was functionally, obvious. Yes. Yeah. Actually, it was really obvious. He's like, well, this is the best we can do for you. <sighs> and so that's when I really started to keep my eyes out to, you know, what are some alternative things I could yeah. do? Because I knew I was getting worse. You were going down a bad path there. I was so going down a bad path. Yes. And it doesn't sound like they were super helpful and being well, proactive. They, they, they just didn't have any, they just didn't have any, this this is the best we can do. We know your Mm -hmm. frustration, but this is the best we have for you right now. So you knew that if you stayed going with the flow, as it were, um, things were most likely going to continue going downhill. So you started looking around. Is that when you um, were at the point where you found the stem cell therapy? Well, I was, you know, I was, I was looking around for all, you know, other things that I could do. And mm-hmm. the way that I heard about the stem cell therapy was really casual. It was actually a friend of my mom's, a friend of my mom's, um, she knew somebody who had MS who had just gotten back from Mexico um, and gotten some stem cell therapy. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, that I'm really, I was really intrigued by that. It was just like sure. an offhand cam and, oh yeah, mm-hmm. you know, my, my friend, my friend Marine, you know, she has a friend who just got back from Mexico. Mm-hmm. Um, and she got some stem cell transplant. I'm like, I didn't even know that they were doing that. Mm-hmm. So I, that's when I started doing my research about stem cells. Mm-hmm. And the first, um, you know, I kept, you know, again, I was a little bit blind into the fact that um, I kind of got up, kind of got caught up in the glory of, um, I was convinced that there was a stem cell therapy out there that could work for me. But like, you know, the government was just keeping me from it mm-hmm. <laughs> because why else would somebody go to Mexico? Right. So I was a little bit, I was a little bit, um, I don't know how objectively sure. I was really looking at things. Well, um, you were, you were looking for help and that is, <laughs> that's a bad position to be in when there are people out there that are looking to take advantage of that. Yeah. So I started looking, there's two things that I did. So I started looking at the clinicaltrials.gov mm-hmm. every week to see if there was any clinical trials involving stem cells. Mm-hmm. And so it turned out that there was a clinical trial going on in Northwestern University with Dr. Burr. Yes. And so that's when I first learned about this HSCT stem yeah. cells from mm-hmm. bone marrow. And I reached out to them and I actually applied for that study. And they sent me a nice note back saying that I didn't qualify. So the reason why I didn't qualify for that study is they are only taking people who had a change in their MRI in the last 12 months 
that had what they so-called active lesions, like areas oh. of your brain yeah. that show on an MRI scan that light up. Light up. And I didn't yeah. have that. I didn't have that. So that and was good so, and bad at the same time. <laughs> correct. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I didn't meet the criteria oh. to get that done. Um, yeah, the good news is that I didn't have any active lesions and my MRI was pretty stable, but um, my symptoms weren't stable. Right. And so I continued to look at my gov clinical trials to see if there was anything out there. And sure enough, this clinical trial popped out. It popped up mm. and it, I found out about this from the clinical trials website. It was a company called Stem Genetics in California mm -hmm. and they were doing stem cell transplants using your fat tissue. So they're calling it, so this was adult stem cells from, um, I'm not going to say this word right, but mus, uh, the mesenchymal. Mus Mesenchymal, yeah, okay. mm -hmm. adult stem cells, mesenchymal, adult stem cells. And they were taking that from your fat tissue. They were taking stem cells from your fat and then redistributing back into your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And so their criteria is that I just had to be healthy enough to um, go through that procedure. Okay. Now, the reason why they were getting away with being a clinical trial, because the clinical trial, it wasn't like I didn't, it wasn't like they were testing the, um, the efficacy of it. Or to, um, I knew that if I was going to participate in getting the stem cell therapy, um, I was getting the stem cells. It was also right. out of pocket. So I was paying the cost. Mm -hmm. The clinical trial part came in is that they were providing a series of surveys to me at three months, at baseline, three months, six months, and a, a year after I got the treatment. Oh, okay. And it was all self-reported. How did I feel? How was my energy? How was my fatigue level? Mm -hmm. How was my well-being? Mm -hmm. How was my anxiety and stress? So there was a series of surveys that I would complete. And mm -hmm. so that's how they got away with um, gotcha. putting it on myclinicaltrials.gov. Right. Mm -hmm. And do you know, did those surveys go anywhere other than that company? Like, did they have to report them to the FDA or do you know? I don't know that answer. Yeah. I don't expect you to know. I just was I, I do know that there's a class action suit against them tonight because I got a, got a um, something in the mail from an attorney saying, oh. do I want to participate in class action suit? Very interesting. Hmm. Well, but I, but I never, I never followed up with that. So I don't know. Yeah. Oh gosh. Okay. So you basically drank the Kool-Aid of what STEM Gen X had to say. I did. Well, I you know, did drink the Kool-Aid. I mean, it's, they do a great job at finding your fear spot and pushing it and saying, we can help you. So I don't think well, yeah, yeah, you or no, anyone should feel bad for that because yeah. that's just terrible that anybody would take advantage like that. Well, I mean, it was a clinical trial, right? Right. In my yeah. mind, I mean, I kind of knew yeah, I was paying, but you know, I, there's some red flags there. There's definitely some red flags there, but I was like, it's a clinical trial. Right. What do I got to lose? I knew it was safe. I wasn't sure. afraid that it wasn't going to be safe. Right. Yeah. But uh, okay, so I get that you decide you made that decision. I but were you scared? I mean, was it a scary no, thing to you? Or you were excited. excited. Yeah, I was yeah. more excited. I was like, oh, this is you know. I started planning ahead all the hikes that I would take. Aww. You know, I was always a big hiker before I started having issues. You know, mm -hmm. I started in my mind thinking how wonderful it would be to to yeah. you know, hike up this mountain or that mountain again. Oh. So you know, I was too naive to be scared. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm just assuming a couple of things, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming, well, you already said this, your insurance wouldn't pay for it. Um, and so you were self-pay. Here's the assumption. Was it expensive? That's my it's very, yep. Mm -hmm. very so I don't mind sharing with you. It was $15,000. Yes. That's very expensive. <laughs> Holy smokes. Uh, 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 $15,000. When I approached my husband about it, you know, we, my husband was on board because he wants me to get better and he wants, mm -hmm. he sees how sad I am. Yeah. And we decided that we would take out a home equity loan to pay for it. Bless your heart. He just wants to go on those hikes with you. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh. So, um, okay. So you've identified the type of stem cell therapy you'll have. So I just want to point out to, um, I feel a great responsibility in getting this right because it's, it's, Stem cell therapy can mean a lot of different things. There are four different types of stem cells. There are different type, types of therapies. Um, and I am to some degree using air quotes when I say therapies <laughs> because there are these shysters out there too that are claiming it and are not. Um, 
Uh, the type you had was the mesenchymal st stem cells. I feel a great responsibility in getting this correct. Um, this is very medically dense and um, I will do my very best to get it to get it right. And I do want to point out that I'm going to be putting all of this stuff in the show notes too, and um, pointing to other resources for more information. So, yeah, well, and I want to, I would stay, I take one step further and it was yeah. stem cells taken from my fat tissue because I think you can take that type of stem cell, adult stem cells from other parts, um, other parts of your body. But this was taken from my, from fat, fat from Adam's yes. tissue. <laughs> yes. Well, I know the mesenchymal, um, they can take it from bone marrow, skin, or fat tissue. The, Correct. So the I want to make that clear. Yes. The HSCT um, is bone marrow um, and blood. The neural stem cells, the NSC, <laughs> let me get this right. That is um, derived from stem cells such as the mesenchymal cells. The human embryonic stem cells, the HESCs, that's... Um, stem cells derived from donated embryos and um, they can actually naturally produce every type of cell in the body, which is kind of awesome. However, um, a potential concern with that therapeutic use is that they've been found to cause tumors as has the last type of stem cells, which is induced plurip, I don't know if it's, I'm pronouncing this right, pluripotent or pluripotent stem cells. They are engineered from adult cells to produce many types of cells, uh, but these, again, um, a concern for their use is that they too have been found to cause tumors. So anyway, I just wanted to put that out there. Mesenchymal derived from fat was the type that you went for. That is correct. At Stemgenics in California. Yeah, that is, Got it. That is correct. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, easy to get in the weeds in this stuff. <laughs> Um, so, okay. You identify the type of stem cell therapy. You'll have the place to have it done, the cost, how you'll pay for it. Take us to the day that you checked in. Was it like checking into a hospital or I mean a clinic? Well, what so, was it like? Yeah. So, um, I flew into San, I actually flew into LA. Um, I had a girlfriend who agreed to go with me. She was coming in from, um, Philadelphia. So she, we, 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 we coordinated our flights to arrive at the LA airport, you know, good within, friend, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. within within you know within the hour, and we rented a car and we drove to Santa Monica, which is where Stem Genetics is. Stem Genetics is in beautiful Santa Monica. It's like two blocks from the beach, mm. and they do an out. They're like an outpatient surgery clinic. Okay, and so Got they it. put you up in a hotel, um, two doors down from where the clinic is. Okay, and the clinic doesn't look very clinicky. It's more like it looks like more like a. Um, you know, like an Airbnb, you know, it's, it's oh. not a very, it's not a mm -hmm. very clinical setting on the outside. So it's, a, it. it's a very nice, uh -huh. very nice location. Yeah. And okay. so we checked in, we checked into the hotel and um, the first thing that they did um, before you met with the surgeon is they had sort of like a meet and greet. Mm -hmm. So there was eight other people getting stem cell transplants the next morning, like I was. Oh, any and other MSers? There was the two people. Yep. So there's oh. two other people that had MS, a uh, couple people with Parkinson's, and a couple of people with rheumatoid arthritis. Oh, okay. Okay. So we just kind of all, you know, shared our little story of how we got to be sitting around that table in Santa Monica. And the person that came the farthest, there was actually a gentleman there from Israel that came. So mm. there's people from all over. Wow. Okay. Mm. Interesting. And so did they have you follow any, I don't know, special diet or was there anything you had to do sort of pre, um, I don't want to call it op, but pre procedure. Um, yeah, they wanted you to take some, um, anti bruising, um, supplements. I think it was bromine, um, the week before okay. they, um, they had you stop taking certain, you know, other things that might cause bleeding or, you know, oh, okay. um, so no aspirin, no, you know, basic oh, yeah. things probably right. that you take before surgery or you know, they recommend that you either do or don't do it before surgery. So yeah. yeah, they did, they did have those recommendations, but there was no special diet per se. Okay. Okay. And then, so <clears throat> you go there in the morning, assumedly and mm -hmm. check in and well, you had an assigned, what? you had a assigned spot, right? So they okay. told you, they told you what time, you know, you had to fast mm -hmm. um, oh, okay. and they gave you the time that you were supposed to show up. 
Okay. So you show up, you get in there. I show show up. Yeah. There's a bunch of, there's a ton of paperwork that you got to fill out. You fill out all your paperwork. Um, And then they, you know, they, you are completely, you know, you're in twilight, you know, you're in a twilight state. Mm -hmm. The first thing they do is hook you up to an IV and the anesthesial, anesthesiologist Mm -hmm. comes in and talks to you. And then, um, you know, and then, you know, the next thing you know, you're, um, in recovery, but they, then they explain to you what was it going to happen. So they explain to you the procedure. They're going to, they're going to take some fat tissue from your, in my case, they didn't take it from my stomach. They took it from my hip because the mm-hmm. um, doctor thought that was a better location on me. Mm-hmm. Um, so they explain to you where they're going to take it. They explain to you, you know, about the anesthesiologist, they explain to you, you're going to wake up in recovery. Um, and um, that's exactly what happened. And so it was more of a twilight state. You weren't, it wasn't general anesthesia, but you don't remember it probably. Yeah. I mean, even in twilight <clears throat> state, you, you've got no, you have no memory. You're, yeah. I mean, they call it twilight, but you're completely out per se. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that there's a little bit of an amnesiac in that as well. So you don't remember. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. um, okay. So you wake up and how are you feeling? Are you, I wake up. well, you're still, you're, well, yeah. you're still, you're not sorry. You're still like, you're, loopy. Up, you know? yeah. you're very loopy. You know, I had arranged for my girlfriend to bring me food because I couldn't mm-hmm. eat right. So we had this whole whole um, whole plan of how she was going to go across the street and get me a healthy meal mm-hmm. from this one restaurant. So she, when I woke up, she was there. She had food for me. And then the surgeon comes in um, and talks to you, sees how you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, um, yeah, I don't remember. You know, you had very specific instructions about when you go home, you know, they wanted mm-hmm. you to, or go back to your hotel. They wanted you to lay a certain way or oh, you know, okay. have, keep your head popped up for so many hours or something yeah. like that. And, and then the other thing you had, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask how long you had to stay there. Um, in Santa Monica? Yes. I could, I could leave the next day after I met with the surgeon. Oh, so the okay. next day there was, next day there was a, a follow-up appointment with the surgeon to make sure that you were okay. And then you were cleared to go home. Okay. Wow. That's quick. Mm-hmm. And when did they say you should feel a difference or did they, did they say claim that well, you're going to feel a difference or well, see a difference? Or well, they, you know, they said that everybody's different, sure. right? So they said everybody's different. You know, they couldn't tell me when I might feel a difference, but they said in general, three to six months, they did have some very specific things they wanted you to do post-surgery. Oh, okay. and one of them was to spend time in what they call, um, and hyper very hyperbaric hyper, chamber, right? Hyperbaric chamber. And the reason why they said that is because it makes the stem cells more viable. Probably because that is like pure oxygen, right? And mm-hmm. so I'm yep. interesting. Yep. Okay. I'm so, so glad we, we so my time. friend, my friend knew somebody who was selling a hyperbaric chamber. So we actually bought one. Oh, cool. And I spent I spent the next three months in that chamber. 90 minutes a day. Holy smokes. Even Michael Jackson. I think he used to do that too. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wow. Well, I'll say this much. I've heard it's very relaxing. It is very relaxing. I would take my music in there and yeah, I didn't have very much room. I didn't have a nice one. So I was pretty much laying flat on my back. I could put it on music. I couldn't even like read because it was too fine, but I would sit and listen to music. Yeah. Okay. So, um, did you have sort of the blessing of your neurologist or were you kind of going rogue on this one? I was totally going rogue. So what my <laughs> neurologist said back in October, so I got my stem cell transplant in December of 2015. Mm-hmm. In October of 2015, I told my neurologist what my plans were. Mm-hmm. He said, that's fine, but I don't support you. And if you decide to go on, if you decide to get that stem cell therapy, I will no longer treat you for tisopery. Oh, geez. So I had to make that choice. Mm. And of course I had, I, I, right. I right. said, well, the Tysabri, I'm not getting better anyway. In fact, I'm keep getting worse. Mm-hmm. Why am I on this Tysabri when it's just, you know, I'm not getting any better. Yeah. Let's I'm going to take that risk. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yep. So <clears throat> you're back, you're using your hyperbaric chamber. Right. Um, at what point did you go back to a neuro? So after about, after about like, so I had mine in December, 2015, by the summer of 20, summer of 2016, not only did I not see any benefit, I started to feel slightly worse mm-hmm. and I started to get scared because here I am. Not only did I not get any benefits from the stem cell, I actually was feeling slightly worse. And I said, okay, I need to 
revisit yeah. a neurologist. And um, I decided to reach out to University of Michigan. I live in Michigan. Mm-hmm. And so the neurologist I had previously was at, um, at, at a clinic called the Michigan Institute of Neurological Disorders, mm-hmm. um, the Mind Clinic. And I decided, um, let me go to a university hospital and see what they mm-hmm. can offer me. And I also got a referral from a friend who said, this neurologist is really good. And this neurologist is really focusing on people with secondary progressive MS. Mm -hmm. At that time, I still was not diagnosed with secondary progressive MS. Mm -hmm. I pretty much knew I had that, even though nobody wanted to acknowledge that. Say the words. Yeah. Yeah. You knew it. Yeah. So what did that neurologist have to say when you told him that you had done this uh, stem cell therapy? He pretty much said um, they shouldn't have taken my money. (laughs) That was pretty much it. They just said he should have, they shouldn't have taken my money. And sure enough, he did a very thorough exam and he said, yes, you have secondary progressive loss. I said, yeah, I know that. Mm. But he gave me an official diagnosis and then yeah. he put me on rituxin or, um, oh, okay. which is very similar to, um, Ulcerous, uh-huh. but, um, but that was like, you know, they, they've been using that drug for about eight years off label. Yeah. Yeah. And that's an old drug too. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's been used for a lot of things. Right. Um, so did he do an MRI? He did. And had there been more progression at that point? Uh, Again, no, my MRIs have been really stable. So my MRIs have not really changed. It's just really, you know, my progress, it's my disability has gotten worse, but my MRIs have not changed. Wow. Which is kind of what secondary progressive MS kind of means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So what is, what sort of, um, care plan did you all come up with just the the stay on the rituxin did he suggest anything else to you so pretty much um he did actually have another suggestion for me so he uh he's you know go you know go on the rituxin and then he recommended that um i see a gynecologist because he said that there might be um some benefit on going on estrogen Mm. Um, but he wasn't going, he, he wasn't going to prescribe that for me. He didn't feel comfortable. He wanted me to see a gynecologist. And it was, I think it was based on some research that was being done, um, on her other female hormones and how that mm-hmm. might be like it's slightly productive. Yeah. So I, I, I did see a gynecologist and he did put me on estrogen and I'm still on that. I'm not sure how much it's doing me good, mm-hmm. but I'm also at the same time of just starting I was just starting menopause. Gotcha. But I thought, well, it will help me. It will help yeah, me. Why not? Flashes. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. That's really interesting. I hadn't um, heard of that before, but it makes sense to me because when I was pregnant with both my babies, I felt so good. I'll tell you what, if, if pregnancy did not end up you know, result in another child, <laughs> I would be pregnant the rest of my life. I felt so good. And I know a lot of people report that. Um, yeah. So that's really interesting. So um, Peggy, how would you answer someone that asked your advice about stem cell therapy? Well, I think the biggest thing that I would say is make sure that you do your homework thoroughly. You know, looking back, the, the things that I did not, I didn't ask the right questions. I didn't talk to one person who had a success story that mm-hmm. said to me, Yes, that was really that was I was really successful. No, I do know that they do have people who have MS who have been successful with getting the type of stem cell treatment that I had. But again, it's been people who have had active lesions that are kind of in this mm-hmm. very in, in aggressive inflammatory inflam, 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 inflammatory inflammatory, <laughs> inflammatory stage. Um, and there, it seems to be that they've had a little bit better results. Mm-hmm. Um, so do your homework and not only do your homework, but ask somebody objectively to look at your homework or look Mm -hmm. at the research. I felt like somebody had hijacked my brain. I was too caught up in the Kool-Aid. Sure. I didn't know how to look at this objectively. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would do different next time. Got it. So, gosh, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your experience, uh, both with MS and with the stem cell therapy, Peggy. It's, It's so beneficial for others with MS to hear others' experiences. And and thanks too, by the way, for all you do for our community, especially being a phenomenal co-leader of the FUMS Positivity Support Group meetings. <laughs> you do you. you do so much good for a lot of people. And I just want to recognize that and say thank you. You're, well, you're welcome. And, and you know, anybody listening to this podcast, they want to um, send me an email directly. And if they're interested in joining our MS um, positive, Positivity Support Group, we would love to have you. Yes, absolutely. So what is that email? 
It's pegfit, P-E-G-F-I-T at gmail.com. Nice. And one last thing, Peggy, here in the FUMS nation, we talk to this silly disease as it deserves and we tell it FUMS every day. If you would please raise your middle finger and salute to MS and say it with me on three. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. One, two, three. FUMS. Nice. That was a good one. All right. Thanks again, Peggy. Take care. Oh, thank you. Appreciate your time, Kathy. Sending a shout out of thanks to my wonderful podcast editor, Steve Woodward of podcastingeditor.com. If you have a podcast or want to start one, Steve's the best in the business. He's running some amazing specials right now to help people dip their toes into the world of podcasting. So head to podcastingeditor.com right now. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate you listening to the FUMS podcast show. Be sure to subscribe to it so you won't miss an episode. You can do that right on the website at FUMSnow.com. While you're there, sign up for the free email list so you'll be among the first to know of any new findings in MS research, new therapies and products, as well as any blog posts and podcast episodes I release. Want to chat with others in the FUMS community? Join us on Facebook at FUMS Now. Thanks again, and don't forget to talk to the stupid disease as it deserves. Tell it FUMS every day.